My name is Daniela. I'm the Tour for Humanity Director and part of the Education Department here at the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. Oh. As we get started, I will remind everyone to please keep their cameras off and their mics muted. This presentation is being recorded and will be available later on this week. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation, so feel free to send them at your leisure here using the chat function on Zoom throughout. Depending on time, we'll do our best to address as many of these as possible. Today, I'm joined by Jeremy Astley from the Ralph Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, Michael Levitt, FSWC CEO, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker, Eva Olson. To begin, Jeremy will offer some opening remarks. Jeremy Astley is the communications coordinator at the Ralph Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Growing up in Montreal, he's always been devoted to addressing society's socioeconomic inequities and the ongoing climate crisis. As an academic, Jeremy researched and wrote on matters relating to human rights and the climate crisis. He focused particularly on the nexus between intergenerational justice, climate change, and the erosion of democracy the world over. Welcome, Jeremy. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And thank you to friends at the Simon Wiesenthal Center for co-hosting this important series with us. Uh, we continue to be proud partners, uh, inspired by the work we do together on this and many other important initiatives um, in the pursuit of justice around the world. And on behalf of the RWCHR, I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Our center's mission is and has always been inspired by Raoul Wallenberg. He was a non-Jewish Swedish diplomat stationed in Budapest during the Holocaust. He single-handedly uh. saved tens of thousands of Jews from one of the Nazis' most brutal killing fields. He embodied our mission, and, he, and that was that one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can prevent evil and transform history, something we try to emulate every day at the RWCHR. I'm honored and excited to be here to hear from Ava Olson. Uh, at a time when people aren't able to connect physically, the importance of building online spaces like this, which can be transferred to future generations, is so, so important. And on behalf of the RWCHR, I want to thank Ava for being here with us today. Um, with that being said, I'll hand it back over to you, Daniela. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We appreciate you joining us and for the important ongoing partnership with the Raoul Wallenberg Center. At this time, I'm proud to present our president and CEO, Michael Levitt, to say a few words, introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Michael. Okay, make sure I'm not muted. There we go. Um, thank you, Daniela. Thank you um, for the team at FSWC uh, that works so hard on these presentations every two weeks. And of course, Jeremy and our partners, Erwin, Jeremy, and, and, and all the gang at, uh, at the Rural Wallenberg Center, they are um, doing incredible work on the front lines of uh, defending human rights, not just in Canada, but around the world, and it really is. It's an honor. Um, uh, the, uh, their their uh, president and founder, Erwin Kotler, has been um, a mentor of mine uh, for the last 20 years, and to be able to work with them now in, in, uh, in the context of our, of our two organizations working hand in hand is, is something that I, I cherish deeply. So Jeremy, thanks for being with us. Um, and I get a special task today. I normally don't get to introduce our speakers, but Eva, today I get to introduce you, and that's a wonderful, wonderful honor. Um, ah, before I start, I also want to recognize we have a, a dignitary on the line. We've got um, the Mayor of Aurelia, Steve Clark, is joining us today. So, Steve, thank you so much, Your Worship, for uh, for being uh, on to uh, uh, to uh, hear uh, Eva's testimony. With that, let me give a little introduction to our special guest and our speaker, Dr. Eva Olson. Eva has been a speaker, published author and presenter for many years and has spoken to students and adults across the country. She did not begin to tell her story until 50 years later. And since then, she has made, she has made it her mission to maintain the legacy and the memory of those who perished. Eva grew up in Hungary born into a Jewish family in Satumari, Hungary. Like other Hungarian Jews, Eva was comparatively isolated from the war raging all around them. They heard rumors and such, but as Hungary was allied with the Axis powers, 
day-to-day -day life was relatively unchanged. That was not the case after May 1944, though. Nazi Germany occupied its Hungarian ally, and the Hungarian Jews immediately felt the weight of the Shoah. Eva and her family were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau, and with the selections, the family was separated, with most going to the gas chamber and crematorium. Eva and her sisters were selected for slave labor. Throughout the war, Eva would endure, endure multiple con concentration camps before ultimately being liberated from Belsen in April 1945. That is when her emotional and physical recovery began. And during this time, she made the decision to relocate herself and her sister to Sweden. There she would meet Rudy, her eventual husband. And a few years later, the two made the journey to Canada where they settled and raised their family. And Canada is a better place, Eva, because you came here and you did raise your family and you're here today as you are so many times over the last number of years to share your testimony. And never has there been a more important time to share that testimony. So with that, I thank you for joining the Raoul Wallenberg Center, the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much. This is a blessing for me to be able to share the joy and the horrors, the joy I had as a child. My family were poor Jews in Hungary. They had six children, four girls and two boys. And they lived, my mom and dad got married six months before the first war ended. They lived in one room with no electricity, no plumbing. And my mom was unwell when she got pregnant with me. Those days, there were no television. People had children. The doctor ordered her to have an abortion. She refused to have an abortion. 96 years ago at this time, my mom was in bed for eight months. So I could be here today. So I could share with you the legacy of courage and hope that she had. If she wouldn't have it, I wouldn't have been here. So where did it all end? It first began, and I'm going to share with you how it began. Hold on, I need some help. I don't get the picture. The picture is not coming out, so that's what I need. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This picture that you see there is when I went back to hell in 2007. I'm lighting a candle on the tracks. The tracks that took us in to hell. It's a glass shot, but the top has holes in it. Allison, mm -hmm. it's not working. Okay, there it is. Yeah, you might have to click on this arrow. Pardon? It will. Okay, so when I show this, 
in the schools where I speak. It's about leadership. Gandhi of India, Hitler was Austrian, he was not German, but he became chancellor of Germany. They both had visions, they both had followers. So what was the difference between Gandhi and Hitler? Gandhi led his people from darkness to light. That's how you are a leader. You fight the rebels. He wasn't going to give up. Hitler also made promises. So what were they? If we kill the Jewish people, every German will have a job. Why was that important? Because they lost in the first war and Germany was poor. If he kills the Jewish people, every German will have a sports wagon. But what he gave them is destruction. Boys at age 10 were taken from their families without permission, put them in boot camps where they were brainwashed how to brutalize others. We had them in the camps. As so were girls, we had them as guards. When Germany is about to lose the war in 1943 in Stalingrad, where most of the adult army died. Who fought the war? The Hitler Youth. When a child is taken away from his family at a young age and being brainwashed, they're not in charge of their life. They don't know. So how did that affect us in Hungary? March the 19th or the 18th, the night before, like every night we went to bed early, because it cost money to burn the petroleum. So, but in the morning when my father came home from the synagogue from his morning prayers, he said to my mom, there are soldiers marching on the street with a different color uniform. Now, they knew, but they didn't want to tell us, they shouted us. We knew there was a war, good. Poland was occupied September the 1st, 1939. I wasn't quite 15 then. But now, Hungary during World War II. In that circle is where I was born in October of 1924. The dark green was also Hungary, but Romania took it during the war. Fear beyond description. Thirteen thousand Jewish people lived in the city of Akon. Eleven thousand were forced in from the surrounding villages. 24,000 Jewish people were locked up in six blocks. They created the ghetto. The Satmar ghetto was very famous. Satumare in Romania. We lived in that area, not too far away. We didn't have to move like some people. It was a poor section of the city. A lot of Jewish people lived there. Every family had to take in someone that came from the villages. And so did we. We took in a family with five children, 17 people in two rooms. No electricity, no plumbing, one wooden toilet outside. But it was okay. Why? 
I had a mom. I had a dad. And I had siblings. Three of my siblings were already married. I had five little nieces, a three and a half year old, a two year old, a one year old, six months and two months. 25 years ago, I had made it my mission to speak for our children. Children whose voices were silenced by hate. They cannot speak for themselves. Over one and a half million children under the age of 16 were murdered. One and a half million. What historians are saying, those children were registered at birth. There is no way of knowing how many more because not every child in Eastern Europe were registered at birth. How do you deal with this? Just for that, for myself personally, just what I've done. In the last 25 years, over 4,000 presentations in seven provinces, including the Arctic, the United Nations, wherever the calling is, I've been there. So one day, May the 15th, an order came. Pack your bags, you have two hours. You're being shipped to Germany to work in a brick factory. That's what he told us. Well, of course, they lied. They marched us to the railway station, seven kilometers away from where we lived. What happened in the boxcars? between 100 and 110 people were packed in. Standing room only. Four days and nights standing. There was also two pills. One had water in it. And the other pill was to be used as a toilet. I was raised in a Hasidic and a fundamentalist environment. I had two brothers and I've never seen them in underwear. And now you're standing in the box cover where you have to lift your dress up or pull your pants down to have a pee. Very little air came into these box cars. People started to die from lack of oxygen. I still see the images of my mom as she found the corner in the boxcar. She was squatting down, hugging three of her grandchildren, Judy, Kathy, and Hedy, three and a half, two and a one-year-old. My sister, Sarah, she died in January that year at age 24. We looked after her children. I asked my mom, why are you crying? She said, I'm not crying for me, I have lived. I'm crying for all of the children. Little did she know, or did any one of us know, what tomorrow will bring. We didn't, till we got there. I 
Auschwitz Birkenau. I turned to my mom as we got out of the boxcar and I said, this doesn't look like a brick factory. Auschwitz Birkenau was a killing factory. 1.2 million were murdered. 70% were murdered within two hours of arrival. Small miracle happened to me at that time. They got out of the boxcar. I held the hand of my oldest niece, Judy. When Sarah died, I was beside her before she passed. And I promised her I would raise her oldest child. A prisoner came over. In Yiddish, he whispered, give the child an older woman. He didn't tell me why. And I wasn't able to let go of her hand. Not until he came back the third time. Had I not let go of Judy's hand, I wouldn't be sitting in my son's house. All young women with children, pregnant women, the elderly. As they were sent to the field near the gas chamber. They were hauling for water, 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 water. You're going to have a shower when you get out. You will have coffee and water. But before then, we had to line up. For what? Selection process. Men were separated from women in a different color. They ordered us to march to the gate where the angel of death was waiting for us. Joseph Mengele. He didn't speak. He just pointed in the direction he wanted us to go. Left or right. My younger sister, Ilona, she was the baby of our family. Not quite 17, a big girl. We were ordered to the right with other young females. And my mom, and my sister Regina, and my sister-in-law, and their children, all to the left. But they didn't say anything why we are being separated from our family. So I turned my head to the left. I wanted to see where my mom was. Leia. At that moment, I didn't know that I will never see her again. And a sadness that hit me. I was thinking about the beautiful things I learned from my mom and the gift of life that she gave me as I mentioned in the beginning. I learned from her to be compassionate and have faith and courage and also to make good chicken soup and bake and sew. The legacy that she left me, I live by it every day. The fact that at that time I didn't know if I will ever see her again had affected me greatly. It never went away. My father, he was not sent to the left to die. He was sent to the right to be a slave laborer. My father was teaching yeshiva 
Hebrew college. He was an author who wrote many books. He was very healthy. So where did they send him? Buchenwald. He had a very short life. He only lived six months. He died of starvation. A neighbor that lived on the same street where we lived was in the same camp. He found me in Sweden. He told me he was beside my dad when my dad passed away. December the 9th, 1944. The month he would have been 49. When I speak to young people, I always tell these children, have a look at the faces of those children. Did they know why they, are they gonna die? No. A grandmother, just like many grandmothers, including my own mom, Walking with their grandchildren, not knowing they are walking toward the gas chamber. In 2007, a filmmaker from Toronto, Don Gray, his wife Yvonne, they were teaching nursing at a college in Toronto. An English teacher from our own high school here in Bracebridge. My book editor. We went 20 days of hell. We went into the gas chamber. We saw the shower heads. That water was supposed to come out. But instead of water, Father Zyklon B with other chemicals. It settled on the floor. After 20 minutes, they opened the doors. They found their children and infants with their heads crushed because the other bodies fell on them. These female prisoners have been in Auschwitz-Birkenau since 1942 from Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. When they arrived, they were allowed to keep their shoes and socks. In 1944, when we arrived, we were not allowed. We were given wooden clubs. They took us to the Hungarian women's camp. To become slave laborers. The capital of the Rhine, Essen, the Krupp manufacturers. Every morning, 4.30, it was roll call. It didn't matter what the weather was like. This one particular day, <clears throat> it was a little bit different. Excuse me. <clears throat> they told us to go outside in the afternoon. Half a dozen German civilian businessmen arrived. They needed workers. So we never got tattooed. We were supposed to get tattooed that afternoon. We didn't get it. 2,000 were taken away. The first camp, 
was a city called Düsseldorf. They dumped us in a field, like a soccer field, 2,000 young female prisoners sleeping on the ground underneath pop tents. Four thirty in the morning, right? And they counted us over and over to see if anybody ran away. They marched us down to the river. This was the River Rhine, where freight ships used to come in, and we had to unload bricks, pile them up high along the banks. You couldn't tell the guard I can't lift it. Better to bear the pain than the bullet. They don't need you. You can't work. Ball game over. They don't need you. And then not too far away from the capital of the Rhine. And that's where we ended up. As you can see, the top part is already taken off because the Allies were bombing very heavily, nighttime and daytime. And we were very happy they came, but we were scared. But they had a sub camp near a cold mine. And that was good. We didn't have to sleep on the ground anymore in the rain. We had bunks, we had barracks, but that didn't last very long. October 1944, one evening as we got back to the camp, we had a big surprise. Smoke and rubbish were waiting. That day, the Allies had thrown small bombs called phosphorus bombs. They don't make a hole in the ground. But as they fall down, they ignite and spread like wildfire. All the buildings were made out of wood <clears throat> and burned to the ground, including the kitchen. The kitchen, however, had a cement floor. So from underneath it, at some point, dirt was taken out, not while we were there, prior to that. There were some shrubs down there, and we had to sleep in that hole on straw like pigs. Totally dark, totally. No water, no toilet paper. Those young female prisoners were afraid to go outside at night. By that time, we knew what the bullies were doing, raping the girls. The straw was used as a toilet. Where we slept for four months. Nineteen forty-five, lots of snow. They stay marching us in the snow with wooden clogs, no socks, no underwear, very dirty and very wet. In the factory, we heard rumors from some of the German civilians. They heard they're going to take us away from them, and the reason for that was. The Russian forces were coming closer to that part of Germany. I remember it. They did occupy the capital. A four day journey, the final journey. Bergen Belsen and Frank. And her sister Margot died in that camp of the same disease, typhoid fever. 
the barrack my sister and I ended up in, there wasn't a chair, there wasn't a bunk, all prisoners were on the floor. What kind of floor? A floor that was covered with lice and diarrhea, dysentery, was her effort to see. These prisoners were very sick to pull themselves outside. They're lying in their own waste. I went outside to look around, hoping I would see a place that better there wasn't. But I came across with several hills of corpses. You wouldn't even know they were human ones. I went to one of them. <clears throat> I wanted to see if I would recognize the face. I walked away. I saw a young girl about my sister's age, wobbling. She was dead, bad, skeleton. As I got closer to her, I recognized her. That girl lived a block away from where we lived. I was in absolute shock. We were taken away at the same time. So where was she? But I managed to ask her, have you seen anyone of my family? She said, yes. I saw Lazar. Lazar was 18. She sat in a camp pushing a cart with other prisoners. I walked away. Instead of asking her which camp, it would have helped me to know where he died, where the bulldozer had bulldozed his bones. I went to look for her. It was too late. She was no longer with us. That bothered me for a very long time. Every year, once a year, that is. We assembly in every institution to give thanks to those that sacrifice their lives for their freedom. For me, a Remembrance Day is every day. Every day, I remember I had a family. Every day I know what it's like not to have them. When I'm in the school, I ask your children, don't take your families for granted, never. It's okay to have challenges. It's not the challenges that hurts us. It's the choices we make, how we deal with them. Berger Belsen. This camp was built originally to hold 5,000 soldiers. And they put in 60,000 prisoners. Approximately 500 died every day. A matter of fact, for those that are not familiar with it, there were 405,000 slave laborers in Germany. 360,000 did not make it. 45,000 did my sister and I were among the 45,000. People were drinking dirty water from the trenches. In Auschwitz, Birkenau, we got a piece of sawdust bread and a mug of dirty water soup. And why was it dirty? Because it was made out of the peeling of the potatoes that were not washed. Here, orders were given six days before the Allies arrived. 
zero supply. How do you survive this? Lying on the barrack floor, very sick, burning up with fever. My body was covered with large red spots. My sister beside me. She was not sick at that point. What helped me to survive? Take my mind off myself. And I kept saying, I cannot die here. Who is going to look after her? By that time, I knew that we were orphans. I cannot die. And this is a fact of life, reality. When we take our mind off ourselves to help others, to be concerned about others, our problems is not quite as large as we think it is because we are concerned about someone else. And that's what I'm telling your children in the schools. Life is not about the capital I or me, 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 I, I. No, it's not. It's about we. Care for each other. Help where it needed. That's what life is about. April 15th, small miracle out of the ashes. Orders were given that we were supposed to be killed three o'clock that afternoon. All prisoners were to be killed three o'clock that afternoon. They knew that the allies were nearby. And we were liberated 11 o'clock in the morning by the British and Canadian soldiers that came in from Holland. Bergen Belsen at the border of the Netherlands. So they just walked over. I remember a soldier I didn't know, and I still don't know today whether he was British or Canadian. There were a lot of them went into all the barracks. This one bent down where I was lying on the floor, put a red cross on my forehead. I didn't know why, he didn't speak to me, but he went to others as well. And those were the ones that arrived from slave labor factory. Others that have been there for a long time and very badly skeleton, they dealt with them after. I remember they took us to a tent to be disinfected, to a hospital outside Bergen Badris. That was a military building, actually, they converted into a hospital. Two months. That's where I found out a typhoid fever. My sister also got sick in there. She probably had it in her system already. The Red Cross arrived from Sweden. It's written there in Swedish, Röda Korset, to give us some advice. You can go back to the country you were born. You can go to Switzerland. You can go to Sweden. They were amazing to try to help us in every possible way. <clears throat> Financially, physically, in every way. The Red Cross was there for us. People that cared, they fed us. I remember that I made a choice for my sister as well. 
had to go to Sweden. And when we came to the port city in Germany called Lübeck, before we had to sail, there was a huge tent where they examined us again by the Red Cross to be sure by their doctor that we're not carrying something over there. In October of 1945, when the Swedish people were awesome, to them, we were not religious objects, we are people. We are one people. I remember, because I, spoke, I speak Yiddish, so German is very similar. Some of them had spoken German. That we're the same. When they cut themselves, they bleed. When I cut myself, I bleed. And what else? The blood is the same color. Where you pray, who you pray to, what your pigmentations are, should not have any effect on anyone. The only thing that affects every one of us, it's our attitude, the way we treat each other. And the Swedish people treated us as their brothers and sisters. They took in a lot of refugees, more than any country that I know of. And I'm not gonna mention some of them. Sweden did it. Leadership, compassion. I met a young Swede. He wanted to date me. And I told him he needs to, you need to go with the Swedish girl. I'm different. Here is what I learned from him. Here's what he said. It's okay to be different. What's not okay, it's when we are indifferent. That's not okay. And that led to the altar. Finding freedom in Sweden after liberation. It's a part of accepted individual difference. And that's what it's about. The next picture below is my sister. She passed away four years ago. She had difficulty in accepting the fact that I married the Swede. And that was unfortunate, but that was her choice. We all have choices. I had the choice to marry a human being, compa unconditional compassion, acceptance. That's what I needed, and I had it. So what can you do? What can we all do? Never to use the word hate. Hate is not some kind of a joke. It's a killer. It really is. It's a killer. Being a bully or a bystander, they're as guilty as the perpetrators. The challenge, be a good leader. That's the challenge. Well, thank you very much. And now it's open to your questions. <clears throat> Wow, Eva, I want to thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I, I know I speak for everyone on here when I tell you that we were just all listening intently to every single word. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what the experience was like for you the first time you went back. So I think you said that was around 2007 or whenever that was. Your first time going back, how did you feel about that? I was devastated. And <clears throat> I was actually, to tell you, I was more devastated to go back 
to Satmar where I was born. Because I had 56 relatives there and I had a family there. There was nobody waiting for me, not one person. To go back to Ashut Birkenau and the other camps, I knew what I was not going to fight. Yeah. Actually, when I, my son picked me up at the airport, Jan, and he said, he didn't tell me right away, he didn't say it till actually not so long ago. He said, Mom, when you came back, I thought I have lost you. Yeah, I was, it was devastating. I can only imagine, absolutely. We have one question that came in from one of the viewers. They'd like to know where you live now. What I, live in, I live in God's country, in Muskoka. And in how long have you been there? And how long have you been there? Since, since in, you came to Canada? No, 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 I lived 25 years in Montreal. Our son was born there and 29 years in Richmond Hill. And since 1985 in Muskoka. Very nice. I have a question that came in here. How did your experience in losing your family impact how you raised your family? What's that? The question that came in here from one of our viewers how did your experience losing your family in the Holocaust impact how you raised your family? My son? Yes. Uh, that's a very good question because it, for me, it was very difficult because was also his father died when he was 10 years of age. So, so you raised him on your own, essentially? Right, yes. Because when my husband was driving actually to Toronto to work, I was, you know where the O'Keefe Center is? I think so. Mm -hmm. At that time, but number one front street where the office was. And one day he was driving in February 1962 and somebody was drinking and driving and hit him. That's so and tragic. two and a, so Jan was seven years of age. So two and a half years later, he passed away. So it was a lot of challenges, but I was blessed because he was always a very good boy. So there was never any difficulties. Well, I know he still helps you out today with with a lot of what yeah. you do. Yeah, he's 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 an amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm blessed, I'm really blessed, yeah. Well, we're all very blessed to have you be able to share your story with us this afternoon as well. I have another comment, it's a very general one that's come in that says, tell us about your life, a legacy that defied, hit, defeated Hitler's wishes. I'm not sure if I understand the question. It's more, oh. it's, Tell essentially the viewer would like you to tell us a little bit about about your something else about your life, whatever else you'd like to share with us, if anything. Well, uh, I love gardening. Uh, when I was younger, I lived in Sweden. I used to paint china with my hand, and uh, now I I love people. I'm a people person. <laughs> And until the virus, I was hardly home. I'm always on the road, as I said. I've done over 4,000 presentations. So. It's amazing. That's yeah. fantastic. And, and uh, busy with the book selling and shipping. And John helped the packing, he does. Yeah. So, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your book, actually, since you brought that up? Well, there are three of them. The first one is um, Unlocking the Doors, A Woman's Struggle Against Intolerance. 
That's five times the national bestsellers. That's how many have been sold. And the second book is when I went back to the camps, Remembering Forever, A Journey of Darkness and Light. That's also a national bestseller. And the third book, Jan and I wrote that together, Mother and Son Relationship, with 15 life lessons for mothers, teachers, and teenagers. Wow, those sound fascinating. And for all of you that are listening right now, um, you're going to get an email from me either tomorrow or Friday with more information if you're interested in reading and purchasing some of Eva's books, which I suggest uh, that then, we all should do. And then also the documentary film, Stronger Than Fire, the Eva Olson story. Amazing. I can't wait, wait to read and watch more about your history and your story. Um, so we have one more question. How have question from a viewer is how have you worked through the losses to become such an inspiration? That's a good question. How do I work through the losses? Well, as um, by by what I'm doing, really, and as I said in the beginning, that's what helps me to keep that spirit alive. To sit in a rocking chair and feel sorry for myself, for me, it would be a waste. I wouldn't do, a, I wouldn't do justice to my family doing that. No, that's, that's certainly very fair. Um, Mayor Clark from Aurelia, um, who of course is on the line, who I know you know very, very well, with the, the rise in some of the, the anti-Semitism that we're seeing, unfortunately, in the world, the anti-Black racism, the anti-Indigenous, anti-Asian, can you sort of sum up your thoughts on where you believe we may be heading or what we can do to help stop some of these things that are happening today? First thing is not to give it any media, number one. Because that's what they want, no exposure. That's number one. And you help others by understanding that that's not right. By not being a bystander to it, to injustice. I think those are very important lessons for, for all of us. Well, Eva, I want to thank you on behalf of FSWC and the Rob Wellenberg Center and everyone here on the call this afternoon for joining us, for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. Thank you again so much. And thank you everyone listening in. We hope to see you on a special date and time, Tuesday, June 29th for our last in conversation before a summer hiatus. And you'll all get information from me about that. Again, Eva, on behalf of myself, everyone else, thank you so much for being part thank of this you. afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Eva. Have a good night, thank everybody. You. Bye.